Emma Perez Lafont Ogan Bozan is a student in Toulouse. She is both Dutch and French. She has decided to work on the history of KLM, the Dutch Royal Airline. She tries to understand how the oldest airline worldwide is still in service 100 years after its creation. Hello everyone, today I'm pleased to speak to you about the Royal Dutch Airlines KLM, created in 1919. It's the oldest airline in the world to be still in service because it has survived all the orders evolving for 100 years continuously. As a real flagship from the Netherlands, it bears witness to a very rich history and embodies all the challenges necessary for the development of an airline in the regional, European and especially global markets. During this presentation, I will try to make you discover or rediscover this hairline, which even if it's 100 years old, has not taken a single wrinkle. So, welcome on board and goede blut met ons, as we can tell in Dutch. I'll tell you the history of Royal Dutch Hairline KLM. You may have heard of it. The Dutch flag carrier KLM celebrated its 100th anniversary last October, making it the oldest hairline in the world to be still in service since its creation on October 7, 1919. We trace 100 years of history while keeping an interest and the role of the audience is a real challenge that I set out to achieve in order that you can understand the role of KLM in the Dutch market but also European and especially global. Today, KLM, the Koninklijk Lodbad Maschrape or Royal Dutch Airlines, is 166 aircraft which serve 136 destinations in the world and which transports nearly 35 million passengers annually. Before I begin, I want to tell you a few words about the framework in which the airline operates. In 1919, the Netherlands had a population of 10 million. It's a constitutional monarchy headed by Queen Wilhelmina. At the end of the First World War, the Netherlands followed a conservative economic policy. They did not want to take any risk by making investments. But, as we can see on this map, the Netherlands is a very small country, about 15 times smaller than France. But the Kingdom of the Netherlands, as a substantial colonial empire administrated by the Dutch Company of East Indies and West Indies, we find territories like Indonesia, Suriname or the Cape Colony. Since the 17th century, these destinations have been linked by boat. But in 1919, when Albert Plessman, whom we will talk about later, proposed the idea of building an airline, the government demanded that it be able to serve the colonial empire faster than ships. I try to understand how the airline KLM, present in all the markets of the world, has crossed over the last 100 years. To try to answer it, we will first focus on KLM from 1919 to the eve of the Second World War, through the creation of the airline, the start of commercial service and the opening up to a more distant world. Then, we will be interested in the period of collapse and reconstruction by highlighting KLM during the Second World War, then in the immediate post-war period, and we will talk about its place in the golden age of aviation. Finally, we will highlight the timeless aspect of this centenary hairline which is Dutch above all, which chose blue as its emblematic color and which, during its century of existence, has undergone many economic fluctuations which are today part integral to their identity. So, KLM from 1919 to the eve of the Second World War, the royal term here has all its importance since it is precisely the study that makes KLM what it is, a royal hairline. The starting point is an aerial representation, as you can see on the poster on the left, in Amsterdam in the summer of 1919. Queen Wilhelmina decides to visit the exhibition because one of her secretary of states told her that one of the officers of the Dutch Air Force, Dr. Albert Lesman, had evoked the creation of an airline company with his private funds. The Queen then understands that she doesn't go in person to this exhibition, she will not be able to take part in this society. The Dutch government at an assembly concluded that it was necessary to create an airline for the Netherlands and the colonies. Obviously, the two people were made to get along because the government wanted to invest to benefit from it and be able to impose conditions and that Halbert Plessman needed the help of the government in order to his company obtain the study of an airline company carries flag and therefore a great credibility. During her visit, as you can see on the image on the right, the Queen is escorted by Albert Plessman, who represents 51 planes planed for the occasion, and who also tells her about the flight over Amsterdam. Indeed, the man seeks to prove to her the interest of the Dutch for aviation, since this overflight of the city is sold to 3,265 people, 
for 30 golders per ticket. It's the equivalent of 20 euros today, which seems little, but is a 30 minute flight, which is invoiced almost to the price of a monthly salary in 1919. As you can see on the image, at the end of your flight, you get a souvenir photo and a certificate attesting that you made this flight. At the end of September, the Queen announced her interest in involving the Dutch government in the new airline, which will be headed by Albert Plessman himself. Thus, on October 7, 1919, the Royal Dutch Airline for the Netherlands and the colonies was created, with a capital of 5.1 million guilders, or about 2.3 million euros. The certificate opposite was issued by a notary from the city of The Hague, in the southwest of the country. Although not detailed, the Dutch government invested 1.2 million guilders in the initial capital. The creation of this airline, which immediately obtains the study of Royal, proves that there is a strong link between reality and the air, this from 1919. For the little anecdote, the current king of the Netherlands, Willem Alexander, whose photo I put here, has been co-pilot for KLM since 1996, he is then king since 2013, and the Dutch only learned about it in 2017. To establish, the company needs an airport which we sell at its base. The work was somewhat shoot at Albert Plessman because in 1916 the government has instructed a soldier to find a land to build an aerodrome. He goes into the countryside near Amsterdam and buys 12 hectares of a fatherland from a farmer, which will become one of the largest airports in Europe, Amsterdam Airport Schiphol. In 1919, as we see on the photo on the right, many people come to see what KLM offers. In fact, on the panel located to the right of the photo, we can read Rondvluchten, which means plane ride, that attracts thousands of curious people. These flights, which launch the airline's activities, work really well. Many people want to discover the feeling of flying, and these airplane tours take place in several Dutch cities and allow the airline to make itself known. But an airline cannot exclusively base its journeys on tourist flight. In any case, it was not the initial project, although this activity lasted until the 40s. Uh, at the same time, KLM procured aircraft to be able to start commercial service as we understand it. They're not wanting to invest in the purchase of equipment immediately, they decide to rent equipment to a British company, thus they obtained one Diavilan DH-16 and two DH-9. The first flight took place on May 17, 1920. About the DH-16 registered in England Golf Echo Alpha Lima uniform, which you see on the slideshow. On board, apart from the pilot Jerry Shaw, we find two journalists and letters written by the Mayor of London to his counterpart in Amsterdam. The flight from Croydon Airport to Schiphol Airport went smoothly. By the end of the year 1920, KLM has carried 440 passengers and 20 tons of freight. In 1921, they decided to start regular commercial service with their own pilots and their own aircraft, namely the Fokker F2 and F3, which you see in the picture. These planes of Dutch design since imagined by Anthony Fokker and his engineers have long been used by the airline. Since the last Fokker, the Fokker 7D, of more recent design, unfortunately, left the fleet in, 19, in 2017. Sorry. However, there was a problem with these devices. Albert Plessman did not appreciate that they were built under license in Germany. Recall that the plane of the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, was designed by Anthony Fokker. Realizing that these were very good devices, Albert Plessman asked the Dutch government to finance the Fokker Netherlands factory, and it was done. Fokker, therefore, separates from the German Junkers and returns to the Netherlands. To return to KLM, the market is growing easily and the destinations are becoming more numerous. As we see on this poster, which dates respectively from 1921, 1928 and 1930, KLM extends to many European cities, among which we find Brussels, Paris, London, Stockholm, Copenhagen or even Barcelona. KLM's land almost everywhere there is a one way, the Dutch people travel a lot and take advantage of this new airline to discover Europe. But KLM also enjoys the frequentation of foreigners who use Schiphol airports as a stopover before going further. Obviously, to transport all these passengers you need pilots, and at KLM they are seen as real heroes. We have spoken on several occasions in harassing conferences. KLM pilots are paid by the airline to take part of it, the aim being obviously to build a kind of myth around the figure of the pilot who carry out daring activities. In 1936, KLM employed 57 pilots to ensure all the operations. 
There is a fairly significant event in the history of KLM. It's the introduction of cabin crew. In 1935, the company recruited three men and four women to work inside the aircraft. Immediately, there is a difference since the men who applied had to have an experience in the hotel industry while the women had to be able to provide nursing care. How cabin crews had to speak Dutch, French, English and German fluently and without any accent. In addition, they were all subjected to extensive psychological tests. The tasks they had to complete on some board were varied, such as knowing the flight routes, hotels around the destination airports, but also sales meals, take care of children on board, and keep an eye on the mental and physical state of passengers in order to help them in case of anxiety or air sickness. In the photo we see, a group of women learn how a Fokker works, although it does not look very serious in the picture, it was part of their training. On the eve of the Second World War, KLM used to deploy women on the European network and men on long destinations because they believed that the chances of medical burdens being more numerous and the luggage heavier, so men could more easily help. In 1939, KLM employed 22 men and 25 women, It also seems useful to point out that on very short flights we did not place cabin crew because it was still the mechanic who took care of passengers so every 20 minutes he went to the cabin and then returned to initial post. The full name of the airline to be remembered was Royal Dutch Airline for the Netherlands and its colonies, suggesting that trips to the colonies should be undertaken. We saw it uh, when I present to you the map of the Dutch Empire in the 20s. It's really wide and above all extremely distant. But KLM was not scared and in 1923 the government formed a committee for air travel to the Dutch East Indies. Although we don't have much information on this subject, we know that it is responsible for organizing and financing the first trip to the Dutch East Indies and that KLM has the exclusive operating rights. On October 1st, 1924, a crew of three men took off from Amsterdam Airport Schiphol in the new Fokker F7 to go to Batavia in the Dutch East Indies. Victims of a breakdown in Bulgaria, they have to make repairs that take them a month before they can leave. They arrived on 24th, 1919 um, during the month of November uh, in Batavia. The aircraft registered Hotel November Alpha Charlie Charlie and its crew are greeted by a crowd of people, as you can see on the picture on the right. It's a real technical feat and especially the start of many air journeys to the, host, to the Dutch East Indies. The following flights will be exclusively for males. KLM does not want to establish the regular line until they are sure they can take their passenger to their destination. The risk of accident being obviously very high. In the 1930s, So, six years after the first flight, the company finally offered the regular flights between Amsterdam and Batavia. Batavia is actually uh, Jakarta. However, the idea doesn't stop here and KLM plans to establish links between the island of the Indonesian archipelago. They do a lot of regional flights within the Netherlands, so they want to do it in the colonies. To do so, in July uh, 1928, they created CNIL, which is the Royal Airline for the Dutch East Indies. The certificate is duly drawn up in Amsterdam, as you can see on the slide. It states that it is a subsidiary of the parent company KLM. This line will stop working in 1942 when the Japanese invade the Indonesian Islands and destroy the planes. On the eve of the Second World War, KLM employed more than 2,000 people and owed 75 aircraft to carry, carry out all of its operations. In fact, and thanks to the CNIL, it offers the longest airline on the market. This poster from 1933 highlights the 14,350 kilometers traveled by the airline. However, the prosperous condition that KLM experienced during the first 20 years of its existence will entirely disappear when Germany invaded the Netherlands on May 10, 1940. The airline will obviously experience a few dark hours, but will successfully rebuild. This is what we will see in this second moment. KLM from collapse to reconstruction. The founder and director of KLM, Herbert Lesman, did not really believe that the war could start, so he didn't take any specific action upstream. However, the Dutch government, also neutral, did not want to risk to being trapped and in 1939 called on a larger contingent of young men to do their military service. KLM was forced to suspend flight from its domestic network in 1939. At European level, they maintained the most frequented destinations such as England, Belgium, Denmark, Norway and Sweden. 
However, in September 1933, a DC-3 from Stockholm to Amsterdam was attacked by a German fighter plan. German authorities will say it was an accident, even if there is a doubt about this version. In any case, the flying captain manages to escape by flying in the clouds, but the fuselage is riddled with bullets and a passenger is dead. After landing without additional problems, the aircraft is repaired in triple maintenance hangars, and to prevent this from happening again, KLM decides to paint the entire fleet in bright orange and write Holland in capital letters, as you can see on the picture. Thus, the attacked aircraft registered Papa Hotel Alpha Sierra Mike displayed like the older planes in the fleet, brilliant new colors. As we know, the German offensives continues and they are forced to remove most of their capital lines. The line serving the colonies and notably Batavia is maintained for a time but departing from Naples in Italy, which is not easy for passengers and crew. On the night from 9th to 10th May 1940, Amsterdam Airport's Schiphol was bombed by the Germans. On the ground, the terminal is completely destroyed and many planes are unusable. However, in the months following, the airport runways were used by the Germans for their aircraft. They also occupy a building that has remained standing to make it at a military base. In 1943, it was the Allies who bombed Schiphol, and this time nothing was spared. The Germans could not longer use it, since even the butyman on the runway was opened by 1,600 bombs that were dropped. As for KLM, it struggles to function in wartime, especially since Albert Pressman is arrested by the Germans for helping some Dutch to flee. To prevent operation from completely ceasing, the director of KLM agreed with that of British airline BOAC, the British Overseas Aircraft Company, to continue to operating from England. Thus, it sends several DC-2, 3 and 4 to operate. They use English registrations and BOAC flight numbers to benefit from the protection of the ILEs. KLM crews and aircraft are always on the same route, namely Bristol, Porto, London. On board, there is always an armed British soldier in case of an attack occurs, the DC-3 that we see in the image, and which is registered at Gulf Gulf Alpha Bravo Bravo, was attacked three times between November 1942 and June 1943. The third time, it was shot down by the Germans and all the occupants died. At the end of the war, many KLM's crews sent DC-3 and 4 to the East Indies to help refugees escape while the Japanese invade their territory. Once released, Albert Plessman understands that it is necessary to quickly resume service. In May 1945, the Netherlands is liberated by the Canadians, and in September 1945, the Netherlands and Europe are again served by DC-3 and DC-4, which return from England and the colonies. In the years that followed, Schiphol was rebuilt, and KLM bought new devices such as the DC-6 and the local constellation. The airline recruited three times more employees than before the war and rebuilt its network. Naturally, the objective is to exceed the pre-war limits. KLM adds for a flagship destination, the New World. But, to go beyond the Atlantic, technical complexity was not really the first barrier. In truth, it was a question of obtaining a landing authorization on the American territory, whereas the American companies formally opposed it. On May 21, 1946, the DC-4 registered Papa Hotel Tango Alpha Romeo took off from Amsterdam with 44 passengers on board, journalists, KLM employees and a single businessman. After 25 hours and 30 minutes of travel, including 21 hours of flight with two stopover in Glasgow in Scotland and Gander in Canada, the aircraft landed in New York. KLM was the first European company to operate a regular route to the United States since flights were daily from 1950. Before 1950, all passengers had the same seats and received the same treatment. In 1952, KLM decided to introduce the tourist class and it was a success. As we can see in the photo, there are many passengers gathered in front of the aircraft on May 1st, 1952, which symbolizes the date of the first tourist class flight between New York and Amsterdam. It should be noted that in 1951, 350,000 people took the North Atlantic route, while in 1957 there were 1 million, including 770 in tourist class. The price was 30% cheaper and includes that we know today in most of our economy classes, namely a snack or a meal depending on the flight time, and 20 kg baggage, which is included in less and less companies since the arrival of the low cost. The destinations served by KLM become more and more varied. In 1949, they opened a line to Curaçao, with stops in Lisbon, Dakar and Paramaribo, and in 1958 they opened a line to Tokyo in Japan. For the anecdote, the crews are equipped with weapons in case they meet polar bears during their stopover in Alaska. 
In the late 50s, the airline wanted to make the trip even more exceptional by awarding certificates to passengers who had passed the equator or the North Pole on one of the company's planes. As we see in this photo, the passenger could keep an eternal memory of their trip with the airline. As we have already mentioned, KLM was a client of a local constellation, a true symbol of post-war progress. The company particularly liked it, although KLM has operated 48 in total. You should know that in the early 60s, the aircraft was technologically outdated and began to be withdrawn from the commercial service. To succeed it, KLM trusts an aircraft manufacturer with which it deals since 1934, the American Douglas. This one then proposes the DC-8, true emblem of the jet range. It met the criteria of many companies. Operated for 25 years by KLM, it allowed to travel above the weather, which was more economical and less dangerous. In addition, it offered a cabin noise reduction, which delighted passengers during long hours of travel. In the years that followed... Douglas continued to offer improved aircraft with the DC-9 and DC-10, as we see on the table, from which I have translated the cells because they were in Dutch. Each plane has been used for almost 20 years by the company. They deployed them of all its lines. Although KLM following very closely the technological advances proposed by the manufacturers, is not very interesting in the search for speed, which is why it remains outside the Concorde project, although it was interested for a time. The airline understands that the challenge is to successfully transport more passengers to distant destinations. Thus, we understand why she quickly became interested in the Boeing 747. It is still in design phase in the American uh, manufacturer Boeing when the company expresses the wish to acquire it. The Dutch government, still very present in the company, is um, the same opinion, which explains why they will invest together in the project. However, to allow the project to have a more profitable base, KLM sends a maintenance contract for the aircraft with the Scandinavian company SAS and the company Swiss. So, in January 1971, KLM became the first European operator of the Boeing 747. The very first aircraft, the one that you have here in photo, was registered Papa Hotel Bravo Uniform Alpha and bore the name of Mississippi. He operated for the company until 1989. Very proud of its new aircraft, the airline stores the cabin you see on the slideshow in one of the triple corridors so that passengers can trade out. Inside, there are always hostesses from KLM who serve drinks to show the courtesy of KLM hostesses and above all to advertise people. During the decades that followed, KLM operated 56 Boeing 747s. It was still using them recently. They were to be phased out until 2027. In this second moment, we saw how the airline managed to never stop completely during the Second World War and how it managed to rebuild itself after. Although we have finished with the story of a tragedy, it's time to move on something more joyful. Timeless KLM, permanence and change. As we mentioned in the introduction, the Netherlands is a very small country in which you will need less than 4 hours by car to go from north to south and which is fully covered by the right network. KLM therefore could not count on its national network, although it existed for a while but which has not completely disappeared unfortunately for ecological reasons. The airline, in order to survive, had to open up the world, which it did almost directly, without denying its origins. KLM, which is the reminiscence of cunning like Lourdes Mashrape, has decided to simplify things for its customers. At first, she changed the Dutch letter AG to the Y, as you see in the top of the image. But it was still too complicated to pronounce. As a result, in the mid-twenties, she would read the name in Dutch on one side and the name in English on the others. However, she quickly gave up on that and had Royal Dutch Airlines written next to her logo, like on the Boeing 787 in the picture, so in English on both sides. Giving the name of the company in English consonants allowed customers to remember it, but also to be able to say it without much effort. But... To counterbalance, the company decides to say it's a purely Dutch legend so as not forget its origins. Also, it is a pirate ghost condemned to wander in a sort of ghostly levitation in the seas and the oceans. The Vliegen Hollander, the flying Dutchman in English, is used to symbolize the aircraft which crisscross the sky above the seas and the oceans. As we see in the poster on the right, KLM uses the flying Dutchman as a symbol for its advertising. Also, as for the name of the company, the name is written in English and Dutch, one on each side for a long time, as we see on both sides of this constellation. 
Today, the Dutch name has completely disappeared, but it remains written in very small, I hope you will see it in the photo, below the registration of all the aircraft of the fleet, the Flying Dutchman. There are other things that symbolize the Netherlands, of course, tulips and mills. Although these visions are purely stereotypical, they are used cheerfully by the airline company, which wants to remember that it comes for a country which is beautiful, pleasant to live, and especially very touristy. Finally, and without doing an in-depth history course on European dynasties, the national colors of the Netherlands is orange, which we inherited in the 16th century from William of Nassau, Duke of Orange. In 1919, when the company was created, it was not to everyone taste to display a garish orange for the logo and later for the aircraft liveries, but many decades have passed, and today, KLM, to honor its national colors, has decided to unveil on the anniversary, the Koningsdag in Dutch, from the king in 2015, a livery called Orange Pride Livery. It's, as you can see in the picture, a striking orange livery that was painted on one of the company 777. However, as the background of my slideshow shows so well, since I set out to use the actual color of the logo, the preferred color of KLM is blue. You should know that this color, always present in the hairline, is translated by KLM employees as a real identity. We speak of blue gevoel, of blue feeding in English. Although we have no formal explanation for the reason for this choice, it seems fairly obvious that KLM chose it because it symbolizes the hair with the sky. We can legitimately assume that they also relate it to escape and dream. This feeling is transmitted to passengers in different ways. The aircraft livery has always blue bands until it became almost entirely blue in 1991, as in the image of the 737. For the airline, an identifiable and memorable color was needed. KLM Blue can also be found on the uniforms of cabin crew. This one, introduced in 1971, was sought to inspire confidence to passengers who flew on board the aircraft. It has been criticized many times for its simplicity, but still acts as an authority where KLM hostesses are easily recognized at airports in the world. We call that this replaced the black uniform, which you can see on the photo on the right, which was used for many years and which did not really inspire cheerfulness or confidence. Straightened by its cultural identity, we understand the social part that KLM integrates in the development of its economic strategy. Although I am not an economist, it seemed important to understand how the airline has gone through centuries of history despite the various economic crises that I've passed through it. The first indicator I decided to use is the number of employees in the company. This one is extremely well informed because we have a graph which lists the number of employees between 1920 and 2017, almost a century. Thus, in correlation with what Albert Plessman memories shows us, we see that in 1929 the company was forced to lay off employees for lack of means. In 1930, 424 people worked for KLM. On the eve of the Second World War, this number was five times higher. Unfortunately, the war broke out, and after receiving two months' wages, 1,400 employees had to be laid off. After the war, the need started again, and in 1948, KLM employed 40,000 people. We notice a slight decrease in the number of employees between 1964 and 1965, which are in reality years when many employees reach the retirement hedge and are not replaced because they do not necessarily need them. In the years that follow, we notice that growth is fairly regular, except for two waves of layoff in 1996 and 2009. To explain the first peak of layoff, it goes back to the absorption of Air UK by KLM, which created KLM UK, a company which disappeared few years later, once other jobs are cut because they were not necessary for the operation of the company. The second wave, during which 5,000 jobs were cut, was the result of 2008 economic crisis which affected the entire world of economy. If we approach only economic markers, they do not identify exactly the same phenomenon. This now projected graph indicates a deep recession between 1991 and 1994, which corresponds to investments made by the company and which are struggling to be profitable. After that, the years were good until 2001, when a double crisis broke out. First, the attacks of September 11 caused a loss of 20% of the traffic of KLM, the part which is turned towards the USA. Then, in 2002, the European sky opened up to a competition, which caused a loss of competitiveness for traditional flag companies. 
It's this crisis which are not well because it deserves a precise study on the part of an economist, which will lead to the creation of Air France KLM Consortium, the consortium which saved KLM from bankruptcy in 2004. Today, with the COVID-19 crisis, KLM is losing a lot of money because has not yet announced that these days are in danger. After 100 years of history, it would be a shame if it ended like this. In this study, I used to try to describe the history of KLM from its creation in 1919 until its merger with Air France in 2004. As already mentioned, it's complicated to brush 100 years of history in an intelligent way without being boring. It was necessary to be able to find an angle of attack which made it possible to understand the creation and the development of an airline which survived all those which disappeared during this century. I hope everything was clear to you, but if not, don't hesitate to ask your question in the comments. Goodbye! This video is now ended. Please let your questions or remarks in comments. We will be glad to answer them. Like, subscribe and share to help us making the channel well known. See you soon!